Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Coffee with the Coalition. Today, our speaker is Scott Schulten. He's a peer recovery coach, a trainer of CCAR Recovery Coach Academy. He's currently working with the Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians in the Behavioral Health Department. And he's a well variety trained trainer of the Native American program Warrior Down, Scott Schulten. And so remember, this is just a conversation. Um, it's uh, informal and we're just gonna have some coffee and chat. <laughs> so Scott, take her away. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. As was stated um, just a moment ago, I am a peer recovery coach here with the, so I'm, I'm also, I'm smudging right now. Um, and um, part, of, part of what we do in the, not just the Native American community, but in a lot of different communities, we smudged with sage, uh, sweet grass, cedar um, are most common. And sometimes in combination, depending on the ceremony, so I, I use sage um, before I talk. Um, <clears throat> there's two reasons with sage. And maybe you all know, maybe you don't, I don't know. But so in, in, our, in our Red Road teachings, the, uh, the Red Road to Wellbriety, the Wellbriety movement began by Don Coyas, a wonderful man, uh, in Colorado, he lives in Colorado Springs. I've met him quite a few times and I've had the opportunity to sit down with him in his office and um, just be inspired. He was uh, someone like him. He was also someone who at one point in his career was an engineer, not for NASA, but as a contractor outside um, working on space shuttle stuff. So he's a very intelligent person, right? Alcoholism doesn't care what your education is, your background how educated or uneducated you are, alcoholism is alcoholism. He be developed a terrible drinking problem and uh, being smart, creative, and um, an outside the box thinker, he wanted to find a way um, to, he was also an aa -er, a real staunch AA person and wanted to connect the program and the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous into um, a Native American a spiritual because he was really resonated with you know the spirituality of of the aa 12 steps not so much you know the god right but how we connect with our spiritual selves so he developed a program uh, and 12 steps based on aa i love his teachings because in his videos he's always holding an aa big book and um so he developed this program and the 12 steps it's called um, the Red Road to Wellbriety in the Native American way. And this is for all Native American nations and tribes, and it doesn't have to be exclusive. We can put our own twist, uh, like the Ojibwe I am versus Cherokee or, or Navajo or Sioux nations have different, different ways of doing some of their traditional connections. And then what he also developed was meditations with Native American elders, the Four Seasons, and this is a book written by elders um, for anyone. It's a daily, a morning meditation. You can get the app. It's also online. You can get the app put on your phone. It shows up about 4 a.m. It's a nice way to start your day. Um, some people like in AA, you'll see um, uh, daily reflections type of reading on, on there. Um, the one that I use, that Scott uses the most, that I always plug is called Free at Last. And so in all the groups that I facilitate, including the one I'm gonna do right after this at the, at the Peer Detox, I go there every Tuesday uh, in the midday, we use this reading. It says by inmates, for inmates, but again, this has got some really powerful daily readings. And at the end of each reading, they'll, they'll tell you, um, James F. St. Clair Correctional Facility, Alabama, assault 30 years. The fact that these people can have serenity and have something beautifully published in a book and they're locked up for mostly their lives really inspires me, right? So it's not necessarily for inmates, by inmates, it's for everybody. 
and it's it covers drugs, alcohol, sex, um, theft, whatever the addiction is, they cover it all. So back to the Native Way, um, Don Coyce developed this program, and I I I took I have them all down. I think there's twelve or fourteen classes you can take, and it's kind of expensive, but I'm picking my way through it. My goal is to be um, a well variety certified um, trainer. Um, right now, I'm certified to, to train and teach um, Warrior Down, which is a relapse prevention, Native American prevention group, relapse and recidivism. It's also, Warrior Down is also a program for re entry from either treatment or incarceration. That's county jail, city jail or a long-term prison in, in uh, incarceration. Um, warrior down, when we think of warrior down, we think of someone injured, we think of someone sick, we think of someone that's fallen out of line rather than say a relapse, right? Because relapse as you folks that have taken recovery coaching know, has a stigma attached to it. And it has a negative, you know, when you think of relapse, you think of, oh no, or oh God, or yeah, there they go again. None of that applies. So it's more when I hear relapse and warrior down or a slip from AA, I, I immediately, rather than think of the negative, I think of what can I do? Who do I know in that area to help? You know, that's just where my mind is geared now. It's taken a while, but I think it's a real gift that I've developed where I try and, and teach, and especially in recovery coaching and the RCA, uh, the, the Recovery Coach Academy, when we start talking about stigma and the messaging class that follows is how do we change that thought? So I work on that in my office. Uh, I hear at the Grand Travers Band, um, I'm here for 40 hours a week, which means 50. And then uh, the other part of that is I drive, it takes me an hour and 15 to get here and an hour and 15 to get home. So I have a lot of meetings before I get to work on the phone and I have a lot of meetings on my way home from work. Um, I try not to do that, but it, everybody's become so Zoom savvy that uh, I end up being on one of my phones uh, all the time. And what I didn't, what I wasn't prepared for this year, and I think it started last year, was the, and I'm going to call it trauma, from our pandemic that we're, you know, pushing two years now, or we've reached two years, I don't really, I don't really count, but this holiday season has been extremely difficult. And I'm sure it's that way with every community, not just the tribal community, but the, that's the community I'm really engaged with. So sometimes I feel I've been, um, you know, pulled apart from the greater community and a little distanced, you know? So I keep in touch with other coaches to find out, you know, the pulse on our Northern Michigan community. But um, yeah, I, got, I think that what that says is I've got my hands full with just the people that I'm able to work with, right? And I'm 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 grateful that I, I work under grants, so I have um, the financial uh, foundation to work with. And the fact that I'm with tribal community, you know, it seems like it might be at first like, oh, that's not going to keep a guy busy. But you know what? And it doesn't happen to be the color or who they are. It's just one of the communities in recovery that I'm. Uh, given the pleasure of working with, okay? Because I've, I've worked with all the other communities through NIMSAS and uh, like when I, when I was trying to stay engaged with FAN and, um, you know, some of the other coalitions, I just, I found myself being stretched too thin and it's unfortunate. Uh, and burnout's very real with what we do, especially with recovery coaching. You know, I work in, I'm fortunate down the hall where I work, I work with a lot of therapists. We're actually down to two now <laughs> from seven. And we don't have a clinical supervisor anymore. We don't have a boss. We're, we've lost all those people now. And so we are really struggling out here with GTB. Um, we have a case manager. We have a psychologist. And then uh, I think we're down to two gals next to me. In, well, in the family side, family services side, which is right literally in the same hallway. We're at a bare bones crew now. And it's been really challenging, like I was saying, this year with the holiday season. I wasn't prepared. And um, I, had, I had decided early on I was going to give myself um, a little downtime with the Christmas holiday. And I was going to take Christmas Day off, right? And 
I, I had Christmas with my daughter the day after and her family and some other extended family. And on Christmas day, I was, I was alone and I had my cat and my fireplace and, you know, life was great. I had DVR some stuff. So I was catching up on some of my favorite stupid fishing shows and life was good. And, and I was just to the point where I was getting the poor me's right. Like, Oh, what do I do? And who calls? Well, Variety calls and they say, Hey, we had our 7 PM speaker back out. We need somebody to fill in. Thanks. And uh, they didn't, you know, ask. It was more of a, Oh, call Scott in Michigan. He'll, he'll do it. He's always quick to jump in. Right. And that goes to what I was speaking about. I was like pushing hours and always like, hey, I'll help you. I can do that. Or I can go, you know, it's just the nature of sometimes we do, especially those of us that identify in, in uh, recovery from SUD or alcohol or drugs. It seems when we get, when we get to a point in our own personal recoveries, we want to jump in with both feet and, and really do what we can to help. Um, and I'm, I'm first to admit that I'm guilty of uh, being overwhelmed. What it did was it took me out of self, right? All of the textbook, I checked my checklist on myself on Christmas eat, Christmas night and um, ended up listening to the two speakers before me. And then, because that's when they called and then they had speakers, the, the, the three gals that closed it out and went the rest of the night were, I actually, uh, three women I've known through the Well Variety Movement that I've met there from all over the country. And um, it turned out to be like one of the best Christmases I've had in a long, long time. Um, because I was, again, surrounded by, by family, but a different family. I was surrounded by a recovery family. So rather than being around my immediate family and cousins and aunties and uncles and sisters and brothers and every, you know, all of that, it was really, really nice and unique to be surrounded by seven or 63 people in recovery and out of the 63 there were probably 60 of them were native americans so it was really strange how my higher power i call creator work and put me in a place of uh like in the big book page 85 we it's then we find ourselves we find ourselves placed in a position of neutrality safe and protected and there i was in a place of neutrality very comfortable safe and protected by a bunch of people that, you know, I identify with, I think like, and I absolutely love, and some new ones. And the other cool thing that happened on that night was, this was, we had a lot of people from Canada and um, Alaska, New York was represented, Florida, Arizona, all through California and Oregon, especially, and then through the uh, center part of the, of the country. Every nation had a different songs and different drums that they brought in to do at the beginning at the end of each speaker right and different ceremony there were flute um there were people that did shaker and prayer songs like spoken word uh, from some navajo people which was new um it was just amazing and it was very deep and very spiritual so i had one of the most unique and wonderful christmases and that was my christmas gift that i didn't see coming um so it just it just i think the reason i bring it up is because it, it reaffirms from my, my greater, a power greater than myself that um, I'm on the right path today, right? I'm doing, I'm doing what, <clears throat> number one, I can, and number two, what I, what I really feel uh, drawn to be doing. The other side of that is I've got to watch because of, of, of burnout and clinical over, being overwhelmed clinically because it's very strict. And we're also in the process of becoming or maintaining our CARF uh, accreditation. Those of you that have been through that, it's, it's pretty rigorous, and especially when you're a bare bones staff like we are. You know, we don't have our, our director and supervisors to, to help guide us through this CARF accreditation and the interviews that we're gonna have to do soon and everything we've gotta do to maintain this. It's really, really, really stressful. And there's a lot put on the six or seven of us that are absolutely left of a 23 person crew. Um, there's an incredible amount of pressure put on us to make sure that we maintain this uh, this uh, this accreditation. So um, it was really nice to have that time uh, uh, that day away. And then the next day after Christmas, I was able to spend it with my daughter and her family. I think the point is that I, when we talk about making change with our clients, right? You know, the only thing you have to change is one thing. You just have to change one thing. And that's everything that includes your your circle, the people that you're around. That's always one of the hardest pills that, and of course, housing, everybody knows housing is right now, but 
one of the hardest pills to swallow, especially out in a, in a small community like the community that I work in, the unique community out here. It's not just uh, on the reservation, the res out here in Wilona County, P-Town, but because our tribe uh, is, services six counties in Northern Lower Michigan, you know, we have reservation land um, in every six county, uh, Manistee up to Antrim and Charlevoix. So we have a lot of physical area to cover and it's a lot of physical area for one recovery coach to cover. Um, but for our behavioral health staff here, it's become almost impossible right now with the numbers that we have. So it's been really weighing on us, but the gift is um, with, <laughs> with a lot of people missing, we're appropriating 43 grants down to, you know, the seven of us, we've, we've had to give back, I think five or six grants and the monies and that really stung. That really hurts. You know, anybody who's ever had to do that knows that number one, your, your pride and ego takes a hit, right? Because you don't want to admit that you can't handle it. Number two, uh, who likes to give money back, right? Nobody does because you lose the opportunity, potentially lose the opportunity to reapply for that grant. But <clears throat> when you just don't have the people, you don't have the people. That's what we're worried is now is because we're overwhelmed. Thank goodness. I've found that with changing my circle and the people around me, the one, the everything I spoke of, I was able to spend this entire past holiday weekend and this holiday weekend coming up, especially New Year's Eve, I've found that I've surrounded myself with absolutely 100% people in recovery. I don't spend time with people that are outside or have a casual drink. Um, my ex-wife was a drinker, but she would drink two, two of the fancy drinks and go, ooh, you know, I've had enough. And I, I never could click, click with that. One, because it's like, you're just getting a buzz and you want to stop now, you know, um, because an alcoholic, I'm like, yeah, son, it's time to go. And number two, the practical side of me was I spent seven and a half dollars on that drink. You better finish it, you know, but um, now that I'm around nothing but sober, including my children, they're scared to death to drink because of what they watched their mom and dad go through. Um, I've changed and gotten to the point where it feels really nice to be surrounded by people that are in recovery. You know, it, it gets, um, it gets monotonous sometimes our conversations, but the people, the more people I'm around that are in longer term recovery, we found that, you know, we don't talk much about the drink or the drug, really. We talk life, you know, we talk, sometimes we'll talk about struggles and who's doing what, but most of our conversations are about life. That'll segue, we seg segue, segue me into the next part. So what got me here on my path to recovery? Some of you have heard my story. What was really cool is this past uh, Christmas night, I shared for the first time a completely different side of my journey and my recovery and my way into being a sober person, especially a sober Native American man. Um, Scott, this guy was adopted at 11 months old um, from here in P-Town, Peshawar Town, Michigan, um, by my adoptive mother, Marsha, and her husband, Rob, my mom and dad. Um, University of Michigan graduates. Um, my father went on to become the director of geology at Penn State University. My mother was a music um, educator, had a master's in classical music and theory and taught a lot of people piano, uh, some heavy hitters. I got to meet some brilliant and wonderful mm -hmm. um, professional pianists growing up and had always had really cool music. So my in my mom's music room, I always had a drum set. But what happened, what I didn't realize at 11 months old, began, began a, my, my journey of one foot in, one foot out. Meaning taken from a very strong indigenous Native American uh, population and um, circle into um, a Caucasian, a white world, and I don't mean anything by that, um, but all of a sudden being, being torn, that didn't impact me as much until a little later, but what impacted me immediately was taken away from the one person as an 11 month old that you, you know, trust and love with your life, right? And then taken to my mother, Marsha, who absolutely, she says this to this day, every time I put her on a plane every fall to go back to California for the, for the winter, she always, she always says, and she, she's so good at this, 
they let me take her now because she's very she's eight, 94 years old beautiful woman and uh she adopted me on this will date me now so you'll be able to figure it out she was 41 when she took me in can you imagine starting over especially with this guy at 41 years old to have a, an 11 month old baby in the house again i no, i can't anyways now the traverse city airport lets me walk her right to the plane in her uh in her wheelchair which is really cool because the they also let me do that with the clients that I put on plane that we're sending out to treatment. You know, I don't have a boarding pass, but the security team know, knows me well enough. They even know my first name. They're like, hey, Scott, you know, and they, they wave me right on through. Of course, I go through the scanner and everything, but I don't have to have a boarding pass to get way up there to the to the airplane. But I put my mom on the plane and she always says, she always says, Scott, I've, I've loved you from the moment I met you, you know, and that's the sweetest thing. She, she says that every year. She goes, I've been in love with you ever since the moment I met you. And so what happened was, and she didn't know this, she thought my Aunt Peggy, who lives in Glen Arbor, they're very close sisters. My Aunt Peggy grew up uh, around Leelanau County, and in, uh, in the season, the summer season, she would always hire Native American guys from the same family to come do work for her in the yard. They owned a lot of property, take care of part of their orchard. So she, my aunt had a really close uh, affection for our, our local tribal people, and she stayed really connected. And not necessarily as a friend, but she followed the people in our tribe very closely. I got to see the graduation from us becoming a legitimate, you know, federally recognized tribe to building our government to where we are today. She told my mother, Marcia, she told mom, hey, I know of a family that has a baby they need to adopt out. So she, she's the one who came and, and ripped me and stole me out of the arms of my mother. It wasn't that dramatic, but... Um, she she brought me to my mom Marcia from my mother Tammy. What I didn't know then was at the time my mother Tammy, my biological mother, who I'm very close with today and lives about a mile and a half that way, um, and where I go to have lunch now and then. She had adopted out our uh, our older brother and uh, two years before. At the time, okay, this is this is you got to remember this is a long time ago. My mother would hitchhike. Uh, walk or get a ride over to the county seat in Leland and ask the judge when I was coming home. She didn't understand what adoption was. So she and, jo and our older brother, Jordan. So she herself had developed um, this PTSD, right, from detachment. And lose, you know, she, she called it losing her children. She thought we were going to like a foster care type of thing, even though that didn't really exist then. She didn't realize that I was you know, I was adopted out and, and my older brother was adopted out. She later became and went and got educated, became and ran our optical department here at the tribe in our medicine lodge. We call our med lodge, which is where we have our uh, uh, we have our medical clinic. We have our dental clinic, optical and behavioral health and family side now. Um, so she she learned and I have a younger brother, younger sister. My younger brother is our tribal chairman and uh, we we. I can't take credit for it, but I do. Um, worked really hard to help him get there. And he's a great spokesman and a, has his heart in it. And then our little sister, uh, thank goodness family, because I wouldn't like her if, if she wasn't my sister, but she's my sister. So I gotta love the heck out of her. But she causes a lot of trouble. And um, I, I've learned to put out a lot of fires from her, but it's been humbling and uh, I do good, good big brother roles. Moving forward, about four or five years old, my mom and I were on a Sunday, Marsha. We were at North Bar Lake, right? Anybody familiar with that knows it's a little slice of heaven up here in northern Michigan. It's an empire and it's, it's gorgeous. And that was my mom went on Sundays with me because it was her. I didn't know that she needed it, but it was her downtime. And we were there and I was swimming in the, in the wading waters. And um, my mom was sitting there enjoying her book and uh, a family of, of uh, immigrant workers, pickers were there, big group of them. Uh, it was their Sunday too. And they walked by and they walked by me in the shallow waters. And I turned around and looked at my mom and I said, they look like me. And that was the first time I started to realize that I looked different. And I can kind of remember even back then feeling, feeling different. Although I will say I've never been anything but felt to be full stock family brother and uh, son 
and nephew, uncle, cousin from my adopted family. They have never once ever made me feel like I was different. That was all me doing that. And to this day, they embrace the fact that I'm I'm able to to walk and, and cross both both sides of me. And they ask a lot of questions today. Even my cousins all, all live around here. You know, they, they've kind of kept track of my journey also because they were worried. I started drinking and drugging very, very, very young because I was brought up. I told you my mom's age. I was brought up and spent a lot of time with my intergeneration. My cousins were that I grew up those closest with were all 19, 20, and 21 when I was 10 and 11. So they were my babysitters, right? Growing up and, you know, they were at the age in the 70s where they partied and partied and partied. And little Scotty was right there behind him the whole time. Well, I, you know, I'd pick up the joints because I knew that they were having fun with them and I didn't know why, but uh, just a little guy and I'd pick up the drinks and everything else. So my first drink was Jack Daniels and all I can remember, Dr. Grabo Mate nails it on the head. It was like a warm blanket. It was like a hug, you know, and um, I chased that feeling for a long time. The, the one thing I didn't do, it's easier to say it this way. I never, thankfully, knock on wood, I never put a needle in my, my arm. But uh, like I said, it's easier to say that than explain what I did use over the years. Because you can put, and if you throw a name out there, I'm going to say, oh, yeah, I've done that. Oh, yeah, I did a lot of that. So I was not just a drinker. I was a heavy drugger. And uh, I started to get in trouble when I was eight or nine years old um, because nobody could explain to me. And I used to get so frustrated. Why do I look and feel different? My family were afraid to engage with me and try and explain it. They didn't know how, even though they were very smart people, they didn't know how to say, well, Scotty, you're different because, you know, you were adopted. I guess when I was 14, my mom, Marcia, gave me a letter or two letters from my mother, Tammy, that were just basically, you know, how is he doing? I want to know how things are. Can you send me pictures? Blah, blah, blah. And I gave the letters back to my mother. I said, don't ever do that again. You know, and it frightened her. I wasn't ready, right? I wasn't ready to embrace my, my native side. Um, and then all the while, drinking, drugging, getting in trouble with the law, you know, um, having juvenile courts and everything involved. I was driving a truck. I was, I was driving big trucks then. I happened to be back in Northern Lower Michigan. And I went to the Benzie County office of the Grand Traverse Band because I knew that all the gals took lunch break and they all sat in the main room at lunch and I needed new glasses back then. So I thought, well, I'll just stop and put an order in. Guess who was there having lunch, working with the Benzie group that day was my mother, Tammy. I didn't know this, never met her, anything. I walked in and I said, hey ladies, blah, blah, typical Scott stuff. I'm, I'm here, I need new glasses, and put me on the list and uh, I gotta get back on the road. And this lady goes, hey, are you Scott? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm Scott. She goes, oh, hey, I'm your mother. Uh, my name's Tammy, you know, right in front of all these people. I'm, so it's a, it was a very cringeworthy moment, right, for anybody. Just shit timing. What I know of it now was it was 25, 26 years of a mother's heartache, heartbreak, racing heart, anxiety worry, panic, fear, all came together at that one moment. And she just couldn't help herself. She literally couldn't help herself. And so I, I didn't, it took me a long time to not blame her for that. Because you know, my, my reaction was turn and burn. That's my always been my MO. And I got the hell out of there. And I probably drank, you know. Um, but I remember the moment. And there's uh, most of the women in there were people that I knew. Uh, pretty well from our local community in Benzie County and trusted, <laughs> you know, I trusted these women because they knew they did, they did all my stuff. They knew me and they have this woman, you know, I'm your mother, Tammy. And you could see everybody stop with their lunch. Like, uh, Oh, you know, what's he going to do? Well, I did what I did. And uh, I don't know if she ever apologized for that. She doesn't really have to. I, like I said, just a few moments ago, that that was a combination of a lot of years of real heartache right and um i can only i can only imagine because when i got sober in 2000 i started my journey in 2008 um at the strong suggestion of a dear friend of mine his name is judge michael haley 
And he thought it might be a good idea if I think about getting sober. And, uh, you know, I, I agreed that morning. It's probably a good idea because he said, you know, this other piece of paper I have, he goes, the other piece of paper I have here is to sign off for you to go to prison. Or you can think about getting sober. I said, well, we'll go with that first one. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, welcome to sobriety court, but you'll never make it. And, uh, well, I did make it. And I ended up working for him for about eight years on the sobriety court team. Uh, it was a volunteer position. I was very proud to be there. But it, it, was, it was something that all along, um, my disconnect that I didn't identify with or work with for the longest time, you know, having been adopted. And I didn't realize also that when my mother was carrying me um, before my birth, it was in her third trimester, my father, when he would get angry and really drunk and drunk in rage, he would punch her in the stomach. And so I came out with a chip on my shoulder. You know, I, I firmly believe that babies hear voices and that babies recognize, uh, you know, good and bad people and tones um, because I'm a dad, you know, so I've, I'm, I've, I've been there. I'm a grandpa and I was there when, actually I was the first one to touch Isabel, my granddaughter. Um, my, daughter, my daughter is like, I want my mom on this leg. I want Santana on this leg and I want my daddy right there. And the doctor goes, oh, uh, you know, dad, are you up for that? I'm like, that's my daughter, I, I guess. So I was there to catch Izzy, Isabel, and uh, I didn't really care to mop that role. But when Izzy was, her head was appearing, the doctor said, so dad, do you want to be the first one to touch the baby? <laughs> and I'm touching Izzy's head. I'm thinking, okay, that's a little close. I said, uh, but I, I was humbled. And then I was able to, to catch Izzy and put her up on mama's chest and Santana cut the umbilical cord like this. He was shaking. He almost fell over. Um, why did I go there? I think because I understood the disconnect um, that my mother had gone through. My that that same daughter I'm talking about is my adopted daughter, and so I've adopted a child too. And to this day, when when I was getting sober, that's where I'm coming in. When I was getting sober, my my first ex, my ex wife and I we divorced, and um, we actually went. The judge suggested we do a couples counseling, right? Marriage counseling. So we went and we got about 25, 30 minutes into the counseling session, and the lady she opened her desk and she wrote a check. She goes, "I'm giving you seventy five dollars of your fee back. You two don't belong together, and I'm not going to try and convince anybody that you do." But we were, we went there as friends and we were actually very open at this point. I'd been sober a year and a half and that was the most that she had gotten to know me in 19 years. And so uh, we just weren't fit. She also did tell me, she was taking me to ATS to, to go test. She said, I'll take you to all this testing. I'll take you to your courts. I'll take you to all these things. But she said, I'm not going to stop. And I remember looking at her and I remember thinking, how is this, how is this going to work? You know, I don't, you know, I had a really kick ass sponsor and he always said, you know, he was worried about when my probation time was up because I would be coming from my apartment in Traverse City back to Benzie County. I offended in Traverse City and part of the deal was you had to live in the county of Grand Traverse to be in the sobriety court. So we found an apartment. We made it work. I don't know how we just did probably because I wasn't drinking. We could afford it then. But we 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 made it work and I stayed in Travers, but I remember thinking all of the AA and everything had gone through my head in that instant. Like, and I really don't want to drink again because they said, they said it like an AA it gets worse and you're, you know, like an NAA, your, your disease is out in the parking lot doing pushups, right? And it gets worse if you, re, if you go back and relapse or if you re, reuse and have a, uh, an incident of reuse. I remember thinking it, it was horrible when I stopped. Like, I, I'm amazed I lived, but it's worse if I go back. There's no way I was invested at that point in my recovery, right? I didn't know what it was, but looking back at that time, I was fully full stock invested into my recovery. I was going to be sober, if just for the day, 
You know, I learned that early on too, not to plan. You know, I'm going to stay sober for 10 years and then we'll think about it. No, I, I only have today. And I, I still do that today, and not just with my recovery, but, you know, with being a dad and being everything else. So when we divorced and I started dating my two, my two biological children, and my, they're called the girls then, they were mid-teens. Um, they stopped talking to me and actually were really aggressive about it. And I haven't spoken with them in almost 10 years. And that's the, I'm, it's a double-edged sword. I'm grateful that that's my biggest problem in life today, but it sucks that that is a problem in my life today. You know, not seeing my two children that had loved me and adored me, having them calling them with things they were calling me, I just couldn't, couldn't take it. Well, a lot of therapy and a lot of group and a lot of everything. One, they were teenage girls, which apparently are not easy uh, and apparently are not easy on their dad. And apparently really not easy on their dad when they're divorcing their mother. And then also coupled with the fact that they were trying to get to know their, their dad sober. They never knew me sober, right? And they didn't know. And then not that I was bad. I wasn't abusive. I wasn't violent. Um, I just was always buzzed. They were confused. They were angry. They were hurt for their mom. And I don't know what their mother was telling them, but it doesn't matter. I, I'm not going to own that. Thankfully, and oddly enough, my adopted daughter, they're very close sisters, and they're, they're, they are absolute sisters. She'll tell me, Dad, I want you to know the girls are okay. Every now and then she throws that out at me. And I know she does that with them. Hey, I saw Dad over the weekend. He's great. Um, and I always, I always look up when she does that. Her name is Tara. I always look up and say, thank, I say, God, thank you for Tara in my life. You know, and if that's all I get for now, that's okay. That's literally, if that's all I get for right now, I'm okay. So it, it, it does a couple of things. One, it, it drives me to stay sober and to be a good, a good person and a good man. And it also drives and, and pushes a lot of value to the men that I work with that are in recovery, especially Native men who are distant from their family or, or going through what I went through or I am going through. It has made me really, really sensitive to what they're going to. It's given me a whole new perspective on how I actually function as a, as a recovery coach and as a, as a fellow recovering man, a native man. Um, so I, I take it as a, as a double-edged sort of gift, right? Because like it's made me really able to help. Everybody. And I'm grateful for that, but it also- It's everybody. It also- it's everybody. It's everybody. I don't know how to meet them, thanks Susan. Suzanne. Anyways, so that's 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 been what it's like. Um, and then celebrating uh, recovery with my ex-wife. She's been very um, a, a positive force in my recovery. We don't talk very often, maybe a couple times a year. But the first thing she asks is, "How's sobriety?" You know, it isn't like, "Are you still sober?" You know, it's it's. She wants to know how I'm doing, and I say I'm doing fine. And then she'll reaffirm too, like, the girls are good. I just want you to know that your girls are good. So it, it's, uh, it's difficult, but, you know, it's, it's not Scott's world. It's creator in God's world. I just am borrowing a little bit of time. And so I'm gifted today that my time that I, I have on earth is now sober and is now uh, being helpful and being a resource and being a resource broker that you guys are familiar with hearing. And that I'm also able to be uh, accountable, not just to me, but to the guys and, and some of the gals that I work with that have been on similar journeys. I could have talked about, you know, my collapsed lungs and my punctured lungs and busted body. And I could have done that too, but you've all heard that, that story from others. You know, I've wrecked a lot of cars. Oddly enough, the last car that I wrecked uh, was sober. I got hit in the driver's door and I spent 18 years as a fireman and paramedic. And my, my seat was like this. And that pillar between the front and back door was up into my ribs. And the crew that came to get me was the crew I cut people out of cars with all those years. And uh, the first thing that a couple of them said, were like, hey, you okay? You okay? I'm like, I'm going to be, but you guys got to get me out of here because I don't, I'm really freaking out. And I was in a lot of pain. I was busted up bad. But I said, you guys got to get me out of here. 
And a couple of them, I can't blame them for this because they just don't know. But they're, they're asking, you know, do you think he's sober? <laughs> do you think he's okay? That's what living in a small town is like, right? That's what's growing up in the small town USA is like that the guys that I've known for most of my life, because I became a firefighter at 18. That's when my mother gave me that gift. You're not going to college. You're going to be a firefighter for your community. That's what you're going to do. You're going to give back. I also sat on the village council for 23 years here in Benzie County. And God knows what else I did. You know, I sat at the, at the dunk tank. You know, I sat up in that stupid thing every year at the 4th of July parade doing community stuff. But um, the last car accident was a reminder that I was grateful um, that I was sober and that I was able to go to the hospital and not not have to have drugs. You know, I got through that. It was an awful thing and a lot of physical therapy and rehab, but I celebrated the fact that I didn't need or ask for drugs. You know, the, the regimen of Tylenol and, and, and Motrin that I've learned here with you ladies, mostly through FAN, um, actually did wonders and I was okay. Um, wasn't easy, but, you know, I was wrecked my Prius, man. I had a beautiful little Prius. I was so happy to be, you know, that guy that had a, you know, this big truck driving dude, you know, had a Prius. I was contributing and being active and, you know, global good things. And somebody in a Jeep Grand Cherokee came and wiped me out, you know, um, then I bought a Honda um, only because that was what's available. I couldn't wait around for another Prius. There was a long wait. And uh, like you both, you all know, I have a, a long commute. Um, I left out the gory, like I was saying, because you've heard it all before. I'd rather talk about uh, the good things in life and, and how, how I'm able to relate my early 31 years of heavy drinking and drug use, right? 31 years from the moment I picked up was Jack Daniels was my very first drink the night before I went to detox here in Traverse City, where I'm going in one hour to do a meeting. I put my, it was 11.03 p.m. that night because the news had just come on and I was, I woke me up in my chair. That was like the third drunk of that day. I went to the bathroom. I had a big, big, big swig of Jack Daniels, poured the rest in the toilet, poured this warm beer out that was in my lap, down the toilet. I flushed the toilet. I went to bed. I woke up on September 9th, 2008 and went to the Peter Detox Center for treatment began my journey there. I went to treatment after that. And I haven't had a drink or an illicit drug since. I've had a couple of times where I've had to use opiates for a tooth thing or uh, a one uh, another car accident that was sober. But, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't reach for a drink or a drug. And for 31 years of chronic, really gnarly, stupid behavior, like lived in Minneapolis, walking up to the window, blowing in the breeze in a neighborhood I have no business being in at three o'clock in the morning and saying what you need and giving him $50 and his hand comes out with a handful of what was supposed to be crack. Who knows what it was? It was probably Clorox, but um, 31 years of that to being in the position that I'm in today, I can't, I can't begin to describe the gratitude I have and the fact I keep my, my recovery coins next to my bed. You've all heard this because when I go to bed at night, as I turn off my light and plug in my stupid phones, those coins are the last thing I see. And the first thing I see when I wake up and turn on the light and grab my stupid phones is my recovery coins. And it reminds me at the end of my day and at the beginning of every day, what, why I'm here. And I always say, miigwech creator, which thank you creator for the opportunity to serve and the opportunity to uh, kick sober life in the ass again and just to be me and do what I do and give back to recovery. Because as, as you all know on the screen, uh, substance abuse disorder and alcohol and drug is so prominent in Northern Lower Michigan. It's horrific. It's taking lives every day. And I said on one of our Benzie, pa Benzie pages, SUD doesn't sleep and neither do I, you know, I, although I do, but I don't take breaks from it and I get overwhelmed, but I, I found ways to keep track of my mental good health and I, I get to play drums and um, I get to be around Izzy and I get to do things like ever, that's another thing. Ever since Izzy's been born, almost every other weekend, I get my granddaughter, right? And that people look at me like, you're crazy. I'm like, actually, Izzy and I are two peas in a pod. She's my 
granddaughter from my adopted daughter, but she and I are so close that she comes to grandpa. She's done that. She's 10. She's done that since she was two. And it's not unusual. It's actually unusual when she's not with me. So that's a testament to what the freedom of the drink is. It's been tricky during the recovery coach trainings because how do you keep a, you know, an eight and 10 year old busy for that long? But um, I do, like I said, DVR is at grandpa's. And so she gets caught up on her stupid television and uh, she tortures my poor cat. It's been a pleasure being here. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I hope I've given you a little bit of insight into um, my life and, and the recovery life of a Native American man in your community. And, and hopefully you have another resource available because of this. And if you don't, um, I hope you also know um, how and who to ask for indigenous peoples and, and their resources. Another thing I also have is I've got plenty of the uh, 24 hour daily reads if you ever want one, or don't forget you can, down, you can download this. Uh, they're great for running groups. That's one of the groups I work with. And then our big book, uh, um, The Red Road to Recovery um, is just like the big book of AA, there's 12 steps. There's also, what I love about this, okay, last plug. What I love about this book is there's a workbook for groups. There's a workbook for men. There's a workbook for women. There's a workbook for teenage, uh, both teenage boys and girls. And they're coming out with a binary book for uh, the 12 steps of recovery as it relates to each individual population. So these are really, really killer books to have. Uh, so again, I'm delivering some of these to Kim. Uh, I don't know when, sometime in the next uh, you know, few hours, but uh, I've got several hundred of these of each. So um, I don't have the population out here for all that, but I've got to spend it out and I'm not giving it back anymore. Scott, what was the name of that one, that first book, the meditation one? It's, uh, it's meditation with Native American elders, okay. the four seasons. And it's, you know, it's Amazon, it's wherever. And, but the, the, the cool thing is, like I said, you can download and they give you, uh, they, you get the reading every day. The, yeah. today, you get today's reading every day. And it's really cool. Uh, as you can see, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a heading and then whoever wrote it writes up what their take is on today's reading and how it relates to them and how you want to. And then there's a daily prayer at the bottom. And then it also says, today I intend to focus on bleh. So it gives you a direction. That's why I use it as a topic for groups. Like I'm gonna do it down at the pier. Thank you so much for sharing so much in um, such an honor. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. He's a superhero. Yes. <laughs> I, I, you know, now this is what I say. I call myself Batman. I'd like to be Superman. <laughs> Superman can do a bunch. I am not Superman, but I am Batman. So I can get a lot done. I just, you know, I can just, I like it because I can cast a web. Get it. Anyways. Um, I'm just not Superman. I've tried to be Superman. Kim knows what it's like when you try and be Superman. Every, you all know what it's like. We can't be Superman. Superman is Superman. Uh, the rest of us need to learn how to take and have boundaries and be able to take time. You know, self-care is uh, something I struggle with desperately, but I, I'm in the fight. I'm still in the fight, right, of self-care. So at least I try. I know what you're talking Jeez, about. Hey, Scott. Um, I'm a certified peer coach myself, um, and God, self-care is the hardest, um, mm. but I work with uh, Michigan Opioid Collaborative out of University of Michigan. Um, we've been really trying to increase outreach with uh, peers, uh, and particularly, we are trying to build some connections with the Native American uh, tribal uh, communities up north. Um, would it be possible to put your contact information in the chat or something? We can yep. reach out and try and schedule something. Yeah. Just to get Absolutely. to know each other and see what we yeah, can put and then together. I'll, I'll introduce you to the ITC, which I'm sure you're familiar with, the Intertribal Coalition of Michigan, the 12 federal, federally recognized tribes of Michigan. Yeah. I think, I think we have like 29 or 28 recovery coaches on staff, peer staff, um, maybe more even actually, I don't know. Part of my Zoom I was talking about for New Year's or Christmas Day was um, out, of, out of the 63 people that were there, I think there was 40 recovery coaches. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
you said what 60 of those were 60 of the people there were tribal as well yeah 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 that's gotta was, be rewarding you know, work there it was and it was it was actually really um like i said it was humbling but it was it was it just felt you know when you're in a group of people that you identify with you all know what i'm talking about whether it's your your ladies coffee group or whatever it is you guys have that's what it was for me only these are mostly people that i didn't know you know i knew quite a few of them but to be uh asked and be invited by a group of people that i identify with um especially in itself Americans, is a spiritual experience totally and it taught me about um the diversity within the Indian nation that I didn't realize, you know, that's yeah. why everybody shared. That's why everybody shared songs and poems, okay. and spoken word and, and different uh, instruments from, they had not just drums and shakers. They had some really cool stuff that, that guys and gals made out of uh, real organic things, animal parts, that kind of stuff. It was, it was really amazing. It was all specific to their individual tribes. It was, yeah, and it was just open to everybody. It, it really was. It was just really short notice. Um, if they're going to do th something for um, New Year's Eve, I will definitely post it everywhere. I'll give a copy so that you guys can post it. And uh, it'll be all over other social medias too. But I'm hoping, I'm waiting to hear back from them if they're going to do a New Year's Eve one. The lady who put it together for the Christmas and Christmas Eve was, um, you know, it overwhelmed her, right? Because she had... I think she had 38 speakers for the two days. Um, so it was a lot. <laughs> and she was there the whole time as the facilitator. So that that required a big uh, amount of effort and commitment on her end. So I'm hoping that somebody else within the Wild Variety uh, groups take over. You know, I just, I've done a lot of work with them in the last couple of years. So I've, got, I've built a really strong rapport. And I've been to Colorado Springs many times now for conferences and different trainings. So part of and it, you know, it's working you know that's what i wanted that connection like we always say you know the the antidote for addiction is connection right and that's you know, i don't know who coined that but we hear it all the time and uh that's what it was for me you know that connection with um i, I hate to be exclusive you know but it was that native american connection it's not for native american indians I'm, it's it's just provided by Native Americans. So Well Bridey and the Well Bridey movement and the teachings are for everyone, you know? And so don't ever feel odd about asking or reaching out for materials because it is a beautiful program for everybody of all walks, right? Any different roads to recovery, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Amen. Uh, I think it was Kim said, uh, what was it? Something about playing drums and why? <laughs> so I get to I get to play. I, I play in a couple different bands. Like one's a rock, a pop band, you know, popular stuff. The other one's a good blues band. I, and I play drum set. Um, I I didn't know this. This goes back to when I was you know adopted out and everything. So drum, there's pictures, and this is not an exaggeration. I've got pictures of me in the kitchen floor, pots and pans, wooden spoons, diapers, you know, and then always singing. I'm always singing songs. I didn't know that that was directly, directly connected to me being a little Indian boy, you know. And so today I still and I, I was criticized for a while until I started telling people, look, I still play drum and I still sing and I still make people dance. It takes a different form than what you traditional guys and gals do but I'm still doing all three of those big important things. And to me, it is a ceremony because I'm sober. And what's really cool is I get a lot of sober friends that come out to our gigs, even if they're in bars, because why? We are supposed to be out having fun doing whatever we wanna do, when we wanna do it with a group of friends and a sober friends. It's really cool. I get people from my department that are sober that show up to my gigs. You know, I get other coworkers. I get people that are in the community recovery coaches, other friends that are showing up to these bar gigs. And they're having a blast dancing, you know, singing, laughing, eating crappy bar food out of a grease pit. You know, it's just a lot of fun to be me when I'm and, and one of the other guys in the band is native and sober, too. So the two of us have a he plays the bass. So we both make people dance. 
it's really, really fun to do that part. That's the balance part of me when I get to be the drummer guy, you know, and I'm helping to make people dance. And uh, I just never realized it was connected to directly connected to what I should be doing. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions for Scott? <clears throat> All right, well, if not, we're at 12 o'clock. We really appreciate you showing up and, and telling us your story and about Will Bridey. And like I said, you're a superhero. <laughs> I appreciate, I appreciate your, you know, as nervous as I get and as, as and I don't know why, you know, it's always flows. Um, I'm just, I really appreciate the, the, the time to be able to share because it isn't, you know, I, I just, I help, one of the things I like doing is helping to show people to get out of their comfort zone and be vulnerable because we, we all have a message to carry. We all have a story to tell and we're all relatable at some point. And if we can help people get out of that, break out of that stigma of being uh, isolated and in, in your own little shell, uh, I think I think that's the best. So Belinda wants to know a phone number for reaching a peer recovery coach. So one of the things you can do that through the tribe at our behavioral health, or you can go on to the UPIC recovery website, upicrecovery.org, Kim, or com. I can't remember. UPIC recovery, upicrecovery.org, all one word. That is the link to the NIMSAS website. That's where you get a peer recovery coach in the northern 21 counties of, of the NMRE and Emory's region, uh, Manistee across to Iosco County, north to the bridge. Um, that's how you get a hold of a peer recovery coach in northern and lower Michigan, upicrecovery.org. And if it's a tribal entity, uh, you just reach out to the Grand Traverse Band Behavioral Health 231-534-9070. Um, or my direct line, 534-7247. All right. <clears throat> but yeah, there's an army of recovery coaches out there. There's another training coming up in March, just so you all know, um, through NIMSAS, Northern Michigan Substance Abuse Services. Uh, again, the registration and application is on the UPIC recovery website. So uh, if you know anybody who would be a good coach, you know anybody that needs to be a coach, or you know anybody that would benefit from becoming a recovery coach, absolutely get them signed up for the November or the, what did I say it was? Uh, you said March? March. March. Get it, yep. Get them signed up for the March class. Uh, I'd like change. to have some of my coalition volunteers uh, take the class just for some education. Absolutely. I think, you know, like you, you said, the coalitions, and I think, I think treatment courts should have a couple of people that take the class on all the, uh, you know, like the sobriety court and drug courts, I think they should all have at least like one probation agent and maybe a judge, I don't know, mm -hmm. take the class just to be a little more sensitive to what, what we, we need, right? Because I didn't have that. <laughs> and it would have helped me. I got through it, but it would have helped. <laughs> so is, do you know what, when they're going to have another class about, um, about like the words that we use and yeah. And what um, and you can go to the recovery coach check-in. When is that? Uh, today? Yeah, I think it is. The three, from three yeah, to four? Yeah, I right yep. here. They're talking about trauma. Yep, from three to four. So mm -hmm. when it when the form opens up, ask then, because Tori will be on. Okay. And, and he'll be able to tell you the dates. I can't, I don't have them right now. Okay. He'll be able to tell you then. Okay. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to. Kim, text me, Okay. Okay. I have um, a question or I have a response to that because I had to ask uh, Tori the same question last week. And if you go under um, upickrecovery.org, um, you can find the classes on there. So the messaging class should be on there too? Yes. Okay. All right. And if you're already a coach, you can take that again as a refresher, right. which, I strong, which I strongly suggest to coaches to take it again. Um, after a year or whatever, just so you refresh. Not only that, but again, engagement with new coaches, right? So we build our network, which is our network. Because I think that would be good to have a refresher of yep. some, some things. Yep. I, I think all a fan needs to take that. Anybody, stigma is huge and messaging. It's so important because every, not everybody, 
<laughs> we all know here how many people get it wrong and how many opportunities there are for change when it comes to stigma and messaging. It's, 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 I cringe all the time. Like, oh, I need to talk to them. Oh, they need to take the class. Oh, they need a book. You know, 